Welcome, everyone. Appreciate you being here. I know there's a lot competing for attention at this time in Winston-Salem. I hope everybody's able to make it out to River Run or avoid the crowds if you're so inclined. Um, I want to welcome Dr. Allison Fleming uh, today, and thank you for being here to uh, talk about these works and more broadly transportation themes in African-American art, uh, 20th century art. And uh, my name is Chris Jordan. I'm the curator of education here at New Winston Museum. And this is part of our uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles program. And so this is our current exhibition going on right now, uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. And it'll be up through the end of next month, so the end of May. Um, and it's a look at how different modes of transportation have affected the development of the Winston-Salem community over the last, really, three centuries or so. Okay. Well, Dr. Allison Fleming is Associate Professor of Art History at Winston-Salem State University, where she teaches courses on African-American art. She has researched and published on a wide array of topics ranging from Italian Renaissance and Baroque art to the Gothic revival style of the 19th century and 20th century African-American artists. In this context, she is especially interested in artists from North Carolina, including Selma Burke, Stephanie Pogue, Romare Bearden, and John Biggers. She serves on the board of directors at Winston-Salem Delta Fine Arts and has organized numerous exhibitions for the Delta Art Center including the recent show, Remembering John Biggers. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Chris. And can we get the lights down a little bit, yeah. in the, at least in the front? I do have lots of images to show you. Yeah. So hopefully these will be. Um, last summer, uh, Chris and, and Catherine and I started talking about this exhibit and this, this theme of transportation. And um, I brought to their attention the fact that there are lots of works of art that connect to transportation themes. And so I tried to encourage them to include some works of art. And we started talking about these three pieces that you see over here, which are all by John Biggers. Um, so you see I have two of them up here in the PowerPoint as well. So over on the far right is a, a print called Four Seasons. In the middle, a large print called Family Arc. It's actually a, a triptych. If you look at it closely when we're done, you can see that there's actually three prints that are framed together. And then the third work um, on the far left is the sketch for the mural Ascension. Um, and you can see here in the, the PowerPoint slide there is um, the actual mural. Um, it's one of the two murals by John Biggers that's in the atrium of the library on the Winston-Salem State University campus. So these murals were commissioned by Delta Fine Arts, um, and so the sketches, including this one here for Ascension, are, um, are owned by, by Delta. So the idea of bringing in these three pieces by John Biggers um, into this exhibit deals with the fact that all of them show train tracks. Um, it's probably most evident here at the bottom of the, the Ascension sketch. You can see it, if you look carefully, through here at Family Arc, and you also see it at the bottom below the shotgun houses in Four Seasons. And this idea of train tracks or actual trains is something that appears in the works of numerous African American artists, particularly connected to the South. And it reflects a number of different themes. It's a, a motif that is represented um, the, because it brings up a lot of aspects of African American history. But it also is, uh, I think, a, an overriding image that many of these artists wanted to include for a variety of reasons that uh, relate ultimately to an idea of community and connection. So I wanted to take a look at three different artists, including John Bigger, so we'll come back to him in a few minutes. Um, but I wanted to start with Jacob Lawrence and try to move a little bit chronologically. Um, Jacob Lawrence is going to create in the early 1940s a very substantial series of paintings called The Migration of the Negro. And here at the, you see uh, an image of Lawrence, but also below that, an installation view. Um, this was taken last summer at MoMA when all 60 panels of this series were displayed together. Um, the, the 60 panels that comprise the series are owned by two different museums, 
So they're not always displayed together. Last summer they were put on view, um, so this is a great opportunity to see the entire series and to be able to really experience this kind of epic story. Um, so the series has 60 panels, and all the panels are the same size. You can see from this view, some of them are oriented horizontally, some of them vertically, but they're all 12 by 18. So they're not large panels, but they tell this story of the Great Migration. And this was a story that Lawrence felt was particularly important because it was his own family story. His family came from South Carolina. Uh, Lawrence himself was born in Atlantic City, New Jersey, as his parents are making their way north. Um, and then ultimately, uh, they settle in Harlem. And I think that for many of you, if you're familiar with Jacob Lawrence, you maybe connect him to Harlem. Um, and a lot of his works really are centered about that particular area. But the story of the Great Migration is his own family story. And he also viewed it as the story of many, many Americans, and certainly lots of people that he knew in Harlem growing up. So he's still a very young artist, as you can see by the dates of the work and his own life dates up there. He is at the very beginning of his career when he creates this particular series. He gets a grant that allows him to spend a lot of time in the um, Harlem branch of the New York Public Library and researching, um, and this is what is today the Schomburg Center, so there's lots of great resources. Even in 1940, um, they had already begun to amass a great collection um, of works that relate to the story of the Great Migration. And he began to put together this story. One of the things that I think is really interesting about the migration of the Negro is not just that it's telling this kind of epic story, which is really, for all intents and purposes, a story of America in the 20th century, but 12 of the 60 panels relate to the idea of the trade, either depicting it very um, directly or referencing it in some way. And the um, images that I'm going to show you are those that relate to the idea of the train. And the captions that you see with them are Lawrence's own captions. He wrote a caption for each one of these 60 panels. So these are his words taken from his research and from his own story that he is putting with each one of these panels. So we can really sort of read this story through both the text and the images. Um, and in many ways, um, one scholar referred to this as kind of like a storyboard for a film. I often think about it as kind of a graphic novel where you have the, the combination of both text and image. So we begin here, scene number one, um, and they're all, all 60 panels are numbered. You can actually see the numbers in the lower right hand corner. So he begins to tell us that during the World War, and of course this was World War I, um, there was a migration north by southern Negroes. And the people that you see here are gathered in this train station. And they're moving towards the tracks. And if you can read this, <coughs> right above each track are the names of the cities. So it's Chicago, New York, St. Louis. That might not be entirely uh, clear in these images. But the idea is that we have the people in the train station. They're moving towards the tracks. Scene five shows us a train against the night sky. And this explanation, this is probably one of the longer captions in the series, but it really tells the story of how vital the train was. So it wasn't just that it was the way that people moved northward most of the time, but also this idea that there was often an agreement that people would take the train north, that they would pay back their passage um, that there was a connection, quite literally, between these railroads and the, um, the, the industry. So this was something that was really cultivated to allow people for sort of a seamless transition. If you could get the train, you could go and then <coughs> pay back the, the cost of your passage after you had received a job. And I think that the, a caption like this that's a little bit longer and gives us more of an explanation beyond even just the image that we see reflects that kind of substantial research that Lawrence did all those months that he spent in the library trying to understand the full story beyond just sort of the scope that he knew from his own family. <coughs> 
the trains were continually packed with migrants. And here we see this wonderful kind of bird's eye view, as if we're at the, the top of the train car, looking down on the central aisle and the, the seats that are indeed packed with migrants. And we see this great detail of the, the suitcase here open as people are sort of taking their belongings out. We have to sort of think about what a long journey this was. Uh, for most of these people, if you were coming from a place like Alabama or North Carolina, if you were going to New York or Chicago or Pittsburgh, this was a pretty substantial journey. So we see all the, uh, the, the car packed with these people. And in fact, he goes on to tell us a few scenes later, the railroad stations were at times so overpacked with people leaving that special guards had to be called in to keep order. And you see those guards in the foreground down here, the, the men in uniform. And here we have the people lined up in a scene that kind of reflects compos the composition of the very first panel. But here, these are actually the ticket windows. So the, the headings up here all say tickets. So instead of going towards the tracks. So again, the, the nuances of this travel uh, is being conveyed. Families arrived at the station very early in order not to miss their train. So here we don't actually see the train. We don't even actually see the tracks. But certainly this scene, the caption, implies very explicitly what these people are doing and the fact that they are waiting here on this platform with their luggage for the trains to arrive so early that the train isn't even here yet. And this, I think, also um, part of the... Uh, importance of this scene is to remind us that for the most part this migration was not just from south to north but that it was also from rural agricultural areas in the south to the urban centers of the north that there was this idea that you were moving towards a place with modern industry and factories where you could get a job and you were moving away from this agricultural life that was not really panning out so here the landscape that Lawrence is giving us reminds us of the rural south, um, that we don't see a city, we aren't seeing lots of other people and building, we just see really a kind of almost barren landscape. And in a way that sort of sets us up for this idea, and this didn't always pan out exactly as people wanted, but the idea was that you were moving away from something that wasn't what you wanted it to be, moving towards you know, that idea at least of the promised land. So the barren landscape, I think, kind of emphasizes that as well. And very simply, the caption reads, and the migration spread. And so again, now we see people moving from the station onto the cars of the train. Again, all of these scenes that are set in the station or in the train cars themselves always show us these crowds of people emphasizing, one, that these trains were really very crowded, and also just simply the idea of the sheer number of people that participated in the Great Migration over a number of decades. So again, the, the crowds are pouring onto the train. They also worked in large numbers on the railroad. So this is a scene kind of like scene number five where we just saw the train um, and with that long caption. Here we see just a detail of the tracks and uh, the idea that the railroad was not just your means out of the south and your, your way to get to a new place, a new life, but also that the railroads provided work for many, many people, particularly the idea of the Pullman Porter, um, an occupation that was um, taken on by many, many African American men. So certainly um, it wasn't just the industry that you'd find at your destination, but the trains themselves that often provided employment for large numbers of people. Luggage crowded the railroad platforms. This is again one of these vertical scenes. So we see again the sort of barren landscape. And in a way, this is, uh, I always think of this as kind of almost a detail of that earlier <coughs> scene where we saw that barren landscape. Now we're sort of focused on just that one person and the idea of these kind of piles of luggage uh, lined up uh, next to them. They also made it very difficult for migrants leaving the South. They often went to the railroad station and arrested the Negroes wholesale, which in turn made them miss their trains. 
So certainly, as we get later on into the series, so we're now at number 42 out of the 60, many of the scenes that we find in, say, the last third of the series are going to emphasize some of the things that people found when they got to the north that were maybe not exactly what they had anticipated. Um, certainly, there are a couple scenes that emphasize uh, riots that broke out within race that were uh, kind of... Um, you know, conflicts more of kind of class uh, that people weren't necessarily expecting, uh, some of the, the opportunities that didn't really pan out. It's not a series that is all about the optimism of the Great Migration, but the realities of it are also present. And this one, certainly connected to the railroad, makes that very clear that there were certainly problems and it wasn't just those guards in the train station that were trying to control the crowds and make sure that people safely got on the trains, but there were also times when people didn't safely get on those trains, when people were prevented from leaving, um, that there were uh, issues that came about um, you know, perhaps sort of conflicts with landowners and kind of contemporary situations that people were leaving um, in which uh, we are going to see these, these guards uh, and others of this um, scene is really occupied, the, the whole picture plane is really occupied by this guy with his legs spread and his arms up and uh, the way that he is standing here in this very menacing fashion um, here in the, the train door. This is one of my favorite scenes um, of a family arriving in Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh is certainly one of the places that a lot of people traveled to. Um, this is the, the steel industry in Pittsburgh was certainly made it a very attractive place. This is something uh, that we're going to come back to. We're going to see another artist referencing these same smokestacks in the steel industry in Pittsburgh um, a little later on. And so here we have a view from inside the train car, looking past the family gathered here, and we see them seated around here in this uh, place on the train where we have the seats facing each other and the table laid out. You can see their picnic basket um, of their provisions there on the table, um, family down to these children, looking out the window and pointing at these, uh, these smokestacks. And you can see the uh, shades there of the train have been drawn up. So we have just really a very brief reference to the city of Pittsburgh, but those smokestacks give us enough to go on. We know where we're talking about, we know why these people were going there, we know why they are sort of looking outside of the train in this sort of excited fashion, this idea of optimism as part of the Great Migration, I think is really well represented in this particular scene. And then finally we get to number 60, and the caption reads, quite simply, and the migrants kept coming. And so again, we see the crowds of people on the platform, we can see the, the train tracks here at the, the very bottom of the panel, and these great crowds of people and all their luggage waiting for that train to pull up. So although there are certainly elements in the, the series that reflect the, the sort of hardcore reality of what the Great Migration was. Um, I think that it's important that Lawrence ends the series on this very positive note that we have um, here, the unfinished journey of these particular migrants. They haven't yet gotten to their destination. They're waiting to leave. They don't know exactly what they're going to encounter, but it's very important that we see them here looking ahead um, and that we see that kind of hope because when we look at these works that reference trains and tracks, uh, whether we're talking about Jacob Lawrence or John Biggers or Ramir Bearden, who I'll we'll talk about in just a second, um, we're going to see that the, the trains and the tracks often have kind of a dual meaning, that there are elements of segregation and isolation, containment, fear, but there's also this sense of optimism, um, and uh, a lot of that relates to the Great Migration. So Lawrence's epic series of these panels, I think is really important as kind of a, a stepping stone in a way. We see in Lawrence references to both actual train tracks and the trains themselves, as well as train stations and the interior of train cars. It's incredibly varied, as we would expect, given the importance of the train 
as this mode of transportation during the Great Migration. As we move forward, we're going to see in two um, uh, of his kind of contemporaries, um, Ramir Bearden tends to represent trains, and John Biggers tends to represent tracks. Um, there's not quite as much variety in that sense with the other two artists as we see with, um, with Lawrence, but what we're going to see in the other two artists is that these elements do not confine themselves to just one body of work, but rather they are elements that permeate a large number of works throughout very long careers that both of these artists have. So the way that they utilize this motif is a little bit different than just in this kind of epic um, of Jacob Lawrence. So Ramir Bearden is an artist who is going to show us these trains over and over and over again. Um, and so here with, a, with an image of Bearden, I'm showing you a uh, print called Conversation that dates to the, the late 1970s. And in a way, I think of it as a very typical scene um, in which Bearden is going to represent the train. Here we see the, the train and some of the other elements that one would find here along the train track. And of course, this big plume of smoke. And this image, let me just move ahead where we can see this image again along with the second one. Um, the, the train is in the background, and we're going to see trains in the background in a similar position in, in a lot of Bearden's works. The foreground is dominated by these two women in conversation, and we can see just behind them a house, we see a rooster, we see some vegetation. Um, we have this um, sense that these women <coughs> are friends, they're neighbors, they're, they just happened upon each other outside of their houses. Um, and they're engaging in just kind of the, the ritual conversation of an early morning. And in so many ways, this scene evokes um, what Ramir Bearden remembers of his childhood in Charlotte and where he lived with his grandparents. Um, Bearden, like Jacob Lawrence, is going to be part of the Great Migration. As a child, his parents make the decision to move north. And um, so Bearden is going to spend his early childhood in Charlotte. And then after that, he returns to North Carolina for many summers to spend with his grandparents for other kinds of um, periods of time. And he once said when he was asked about this, this move away from North Carolina, he said, I never left Charlotte except physically. So that, that quote should plant in your mind the importance and the, the kind of nostalgia of this childhood in Charlotte. And the second scene that I'm showing you here um, is a, an image just a little bit earlier than conversation um, from the 1960s. And in many respects, it looks very similar to conversation. The composition is quite similar where we have this, um, this building here, we have the train running through the background, we have some vegetation, and then we have these two figures here in the foreground that look like they're engaged in conversation. Um, so a lot of similar elements. This is a collage. Um, but the fact is, is that this image, Prevalence of Ritual Tidings, comes from a series that Bearden had created in the 1960s that involves uh, religious and spiritual rituals. So what the scene is that we're actually looking at here is the scene of the Annunciation. So this woman here is not just a woman, but she's the Virgin Mary. And next to her, you might notice that her companion here has wings. This is the angel Gabriel handing her this flower. So these two scenes look a lot alike. They seem to show us the same kinds of people doing the same kinds of things. However, one of them is in effect an illustration of a long-standing Christian uh, tradition, a story that comes from the Bible, as opposed to just a conversation of two women outside their, their homes. And this is one of the things that I think is important to understand about Bearden that he has the ability to represent figures and objects in settings that are universal. That you can look at these scenes, that they transcend 
the actual stories that are being told. But certainly while this is a scene of the Annunciation, it's a scene of the Annunciation as filtered through the eyes of Ramirez Bearden, a man who comes from Charlotte, who is really interested in representing over and over, and again, two additional scenes, Sunset Limited and the train whistles, that show us, again, a very similar composition of women conversing in the foreground, and then a train sort of rolling through the background. And these scenes represent, the, the, as I said, this kind of nostalgia um, that, that Bearden has. And um, I just want to, to read to you a passage here. This is a poem that Bearden wrote in 1964. Sometimes I remember my grandfather's house, a garden with tiger lilies my grandmother waving a white apron to passing trains on that trestle across the clay road. So I think that many of us can relate to this idea of the clay road and the, the train that passes by. And this is certainly an image, and Bearden talked about this throughout his adult life, of this idea of how his grandparents' house was situated and the train that rumbled nearby and this idea that they could identify the different trains that came by and they knew where they were coming from and where they were going and how exciting this was and this idea of how important that train was as part of his North Carolina childhood. And so we see this represented over and over. Um, this is what I just read to you, this, this idea of the, the train. And he mentions explicitly his grandmother waving the white apron. Um, you know, Bearden has a way, even for those of us who didn't necessarily have the same childhood in Charlotte in the, the 19 teens, he brings these images alive for us, uh, in this case through his words, um, as well as through these visual images. And another one that, that, again, is sort of a, a transformation of this particular idea. Again, with similar figures, similar kind of landscape, the train in the background, and this idea that we have this Carolina memory that is being filtered through the mind of Bearden and understandable to all of us. So there's a, a certain amount of nostalgia that we have in many of these images. Now, Bearden does create um, a, a, an image, first in collage, then in print, and then in a series of unique prints called The Trains. Begins in 1974. Um, for a couple years after that, he begins to work with this image and transform it in many ways. And uh, Bearden was certainly an artist who worked in a variety of media. Um, he created paintings. I think he's perhaps best known for his works in collage. And then, uh, particularly in the 1960s and 70s, he begins to explore uh, printmaking in great depth. And uh, the idea of sort of transforming and improvising and taking an image and reworking it over and over again in different media, and in this case, so we have the transformation from the collage to the print, and then these are three of the different um, unique prints that are created from the, the plate of the train. Um, the, the larger one is called through freight, and then there's two others. So these are uh, prints that are made, single prints, um, photo etchings with hand coloring. So there's 12 of them. The series is called 12 trains all together. So we have the, the same composition, but there's different inks that are being used. There are other um, kind of minor changes and all of the names of them in the, the 12 trains, like through freight, and um, one of them is called Deadhead, No Passengers, uh, another one's called um, Sunset Express. They're all, uh, again, references to these trains. And this is something that um, we can see. Bearden was also a musician. He loved jazz. Um, he loved this idea of improvisation and transformation, of taking a motif or a theme and reworking it over and over again and uh, certainly what he does with the, the train series is uh, something that we can relate to that. And I think even the theme of the train overall, with the variety of meanings that it is going to imbue, again, positive and negative, and a whole variety of uh, different stories that can be told as we look at these images and we 
see the figures in the foreground, and we see the train in the background, and we think about what is the relationship between these figures and the train? Are they coming? Are they going? Is that train connecting them to something? Is it separating them from something? There are so many questions that we can ask that there's a kind of malleability and adaptation with the theme of the train, and that we see that also with the, the media that Bearden uh, works in as well. So in a way, this sort of motif is something that is um, particularly well adapted for what he is, is wanting. And these images that involve trains um, go on and on, and you can see them. I'm just going to flip through a couple more. And uh, you can see, again, these sort of different relationships between the, the train and the landscape and the figures. And they date to all different periods, to the 60s, to the 70s. Um, we see you know, trains sometimes a little bit more prominent. We sort of, uh, again, are thinking about Southern nostalgia and these different scenes of everyday life that, that Bearden is telling us. Who are these figures? What are they doing? Were these people that he knew in his childhood? Because he often talks about the fact that he remembers uh, different people that in his grandparents' neighborhood and how he represented them um, and uh, the, the way in which um, this one, uh, again, it's maybe a, a little bit dark, but there's a, a woman lying across the bed here, and we see this train rumbling through the landscape through the, the open window here in the background, which is something that, again, Beard would like to, to do often. We would see a, a, another scene related to the main scene through a door or a window, and so here we um, are going to see that in the, the Daybreak Express, again, perhaps sort of referencing this idea that, you know, as a child, laying in bed late at night, early in the morning. You could sort of tell the time by what train was coming by. This is <coughs> something that, that Bearden often talked about, the, the, that connection to the train. Uh, Mr. Jeremiah's Sunset Guitar, again, references these memories of people that he knew. Um, and this is one that comes from a series that he did fairly late in life, in, in the 1980s, when he goes back and creates these um, series um, called Profiles, one of them that involves, uh, say, kind of nostalgia of the 1920s, one of them of the 1930s. So again, that they're supposed to re reflect these scenes of his childhood, of his youth. Um, and in a way, I think it's just sort of another opportunity for Bearden to get all nostalgic and to talk again in a visual form about his childhood. Um, because as you can probably tell by the number of scenes that I've shown you, this was something that he liked to go back to again and again. Um, heavy freight Mecklenburg evening. Um, I love the, this landscape, again, with the, the train here in the background. It almost sort of blends in uh, with the, the way that this image is created, this kind of wonderful uh, sky. And the pepper jelly lady, uh, also like Mr. Jeremiah, is another figure. This is both uh, the scene as he represented it in collage and then later in a lithograph with this uh, wonderful border around it. The pepper jelly lady was again another woman that he remembered from his grandparents' neighborhood who would go around selling the, the pepper jelly. Um, and there's a, a rooster here and all these kind of great elements that we frequently see in here in works. And again, through this kind of uh, gateway, we have the, the train in the background. And there's even a train. Oh, this is a, a watercolor that he drew for Maya Angelou. This is uh, one of the works from her estate that was um, auctioned. Um, and uh, again, you can kind of read the, the Southern Limited name that he puts on it. Um, and uh, again, uh, inscribed for Maya. Um, the theme of the train just never goes away for Bearden. And then one last scene by Bearden um, that sort of takes us in a slightly different direction but allows us to go back to one of the, the images by Jacob Lawrence. The Millhand lunch bucket is a scene that shows us um, the, the steel mills in Pittsburgh. So um, as much as we talk about Bearden and his grandparents, um, who his paternal grandparents who lived in Charlotte and the kind of continual visits back um, to that home, his maternal grandmother lives in Pittsburgh, and she owns a boarding house, and Bearden spent different periods of time with her in Pittsburgh. Um, the, the first is in the year 1920, 
Uh, I think he was in fourth grade. He spent the year uh, with them in this boarding house. And then later on uh, in high school, um, he graduated from high school in Pennsylvania. He spent time, again, living in the boarding house with the, with the grandparents and uh, in a, a later period of time actually working in the steel mills. So what we see here in the mill hands lunch bucket is a view of the boarding house, so a kind of domestic scene in the center with people gathered around the, the dining table. This is the mill hand walking down the stairs and this very large hand here reaching for the lunch bucket. And then out the window here is where we see the train <coughs> and the, the smokestacks of the steel mills beyond. So Pittsburgh, of course, was one of these destinations and the great industry of the um, steel was what drew these migrants. So this scene by Bearden is going to reflect, again, like Lawrence, his personal story of the great migration coming from North Carolina to, at this point in time, Pittsburgh, as well as many of the other places in the North where Bearden lived the experience of the steel mill and the boarding houses where the men lived in those steel neighborhoods um, and the whole sort of interior, this kind of wonderful domestic interior setting that we have. And again, this view to the outside that shows us the train that brought the migrants here to begin with, that is in many cases bringing raw materials to them, that is taking the finished product away and the railroads, again, become so vitally important for this particular industry. So it's kind of, in a way, if we sort of think about this relationship between Lawrence and now Bearden, Lawrence kind of gave us this grand narrative of these 60 scenes, and he highlighted the, the, um, the, the whole story. Bearden now is kind of digging in deep to just one element of these migrants that came to Pittsburgh, they live in this boarding house, they're working in this steel mill. And so, again, we have this train that is so important in referencing where, where they actually, you know, are in relation to where they come from. And then finally we get to John Biggers, and uh, again, an image here of Biggers with both of the murals um, from uh, o O'Kelly Library. And um, it's really Ascension over here on the left, it's the one with the, the train tracks in the foreground that I'm going to talk a little bit more about but the opposite mural is origins. The idea of the, the two murals is to really kind of show us, again, sort of like Lawrence, a kind of grand sweeping narrative, but it's not really a narrative in this sense. We have this idea of the origins of life and these representations um, of the, the figures and other elements representing the origins of life in Africa. Ascension is going to sort of bring us a little bit more up to the contemporary period and this idea of African Americans in the 20th century and many of the, the elements that we're going to particularly see. And so you can probably see in the, the sketch there, um, in the, the full color a little bit better, some of those elements. And these are the other two, we'll come back to um, them in just a moment. This image by Biggers is created during his student days. And it's probably the earliest image that we have by Biggers that shows us a train or tracks. In this case, we have the tracks. And um, this is, I think, a, a wonderful image that tells us a lot about Biggers' training as an artist and perhaps one way in which he initially thought about the motif of the train tracks and how he was able to sort of move it into a variety of other works over his long career. So Biggers um, went to uh, Hampton University as an undergraduate in, in the early 1940s. Um, he didn't actually graduate from Hampton. He was, his education was interrupted uh, by World War II. Um, but this is a work that he creates uh, during his first couple of years at Hampton. He worked with an art instructor named Victor Lowenfeld, who was um, a Jewish man who had escaped from Nazi persecution in Austria. And Lowenfeld became really a, a revered figure at Hampton. Um, even today, if you go to the museum at Hampton, you'll see um, his own art, the art of many of his students that he taught at Hampton, many of whom went on to become 
uh, quite uh, prominent artists themselves. Um, he, his dedication as a teacher uh, certainly it is something that is quite well known and still on display at Hampton. Um, John Biggers was probably the, his student who went on to kind of the, the greatest fame. But one of the things that, that Lowenfeld tried to sort of bring into his art classes was this idea of the everyday life, that not every work of art needs to represent the grand, the magnificent, the, the ideal, um, but that there is a great value in representing everyday life. And I think that this is something that we've already seen with Lawrence and with Beard. Um, and that we're really, in fact, seeing in this exact period of time, so 1943, this is immediately after Lawrence had finished the migration of the Negro uh, series. Um, this scene of the Gleaners is one that Biggers is going to paint um, after being introduced to other images by European artists of these kinds of everyday life scenes, these genre scenes. And the image that really seemed to have a, a particularly profound influence on John Biggers was Millet's Gleaners. So this work that you see over here on the right from the mid-19th century. And Lohenfeld would show these kinds of images to his students. Um, Millet's image comes from the, this style that was really popular in mid-19th century France called realism, where the, the kind of nitty-gritty was, was um, represented and that there was no idealization. Um, it was about hard labor and peasants and these scenes of everyday life. And so Malay's, uh, Malay's uh, gleaners here shows us these women bent over, gleaning the wheat from the fields, the idea that after the, the farmers have come through with their, their workers and their machinery, there's just all these little bits and pieces of wheat that are left over, and it's they're too small and too fragmentary for the farmers themselves to actually bother picking up. It's not worth their while. So they allow these peasant women in the community to come in and literally glean the wheat to pick up these bits and pieces, which for them are extraordinarily <coughs> important. This is how they're going to feed their families. But as you can see from the way that Malay represents these figures, I mean, these women bent double, leaning down, can imagine the back-breaking work that this is. So um, he's showing us this scene, again, not grand or magnificent. It's a very quiet scene, but very poignant in sort of reminding us of you know, what actually goes on in everyday life. So John Biggers is going to take Millet's gleaners, and he is going to essentially transform that scene into one that comes out of his own life, his own childhood in Gastonia. Um, let me go back here to the, you can see it's slightly uh, larger. And here, instead of these wheat fields, we have the, the sort of you know shanties next to the train tracks. We have the coal truck, the, the coal uh, train that's just gone by. What the people are gleaning here now are these little teeny tiny bits of coal, and you can see them sort of dotting the train tracks, these little tiny bits that have fallen off the cars of coal as they pass through. They come out onto the tracks, they're again bent double, picking up these pieces of coal that are going to be worth something to them. We see the, this kind of skyscrapers of the city beyond. Biggers has really transformed that image from a century earlier in France to something that says something about his own life, his own upbringing, the importance of what is going on here. And again, it's maybe a little bit of nostalgia, but it's not quite the same nostalgia that we saw with Bearden, but it's a way of bigger sort of remembering where he comes from, his life, and how important this can be. So, one of um, Bigger's biographers talked about this. I'm just going to read you this, this quote. Um, this comes from the um, catalog for the Big, uh, Bigger's retrospective exhibition from 1995 of the award law rights. The railroad which transported black families and black culture from the south to the north was a symbol of migration and escape. Although it remained a lifeline that connected the old with the new, the railroad was also a symbol of isolation and segregation, 
dividing the white and black sections of southern towns. And I think that this is a quote that in, in many ways reflects other works, and in fact she's not necessarily just talking about the, the gleaners when she wrote this, but I think that it really uh, sums up what we are looking at here. We see perhaps the, the sort of less glamorous side of the railroad, um, and it reminds us of some of those elements, but I don't think that that idea of hope is necessarily absent uh, from this. What we're, what we're shown is really hardworking people that are trying to do the best that they can, despite perhaps what is seen as this kind of uh, divisionary force of the railroad tracks in this particular work. But Vickers is going to go on to show us the train tracks over and over again in other works. And uh, many of his works, particularly from the 1980s and the 1990s, are going to show us the railroad tracks in front of shotgun houses. So this is something that we see in the print of the Four Seasons. We see it again in a, a painting from 1987 simply called Shotguns. We see it the following year in a painting called At the Railroad. And most of these scenes, um, in a way, certainly may bring back what we saw in the Gleaners, but they more specifically reference the Third Ward of Houston, which is where Biggers uh, lived and worked for many, many years. So unlike Lawrence and Bearden, um, John Biggers was not someone who participated in the Great Migration per se. He did go north to Pennsylvania to finish his education um, after Biggers um, got out of the, uh, the Navy in World War II. Victor Lowenfeld, his teacher, had moved on to Penn State. Biggers ended up moving to Pennsylvania. He ended up getting um, all of his degrees, bachelor's, master's, and his PhD from Penn State in art education. Um, but he didn't particularly love living in Pennsylvania. Um, and he, uh, in many ways, yearned to go back to the South. And uh, he accepted a teaching job in Houston. And so Houston, other than North Carolina, is the place that, that many of us think about when we think of Biggers. And so many of these images here with the shotgun houses reflect the, uh, and, and Biggers describes this, the idea of the, the women standing here on the porches. Um, the, the women themselves are so tall <coughs> that their, their heads really uh, reach the, the roofs of the houses in many ways that makes us think about these women really as the physical pillars of these houses he's trying to represent these strong women and they become almost architectural elements. This is something that we see going back to ancient Greek architecture and Biggers revives it here of the way that uh, a column can be transformed into a human figure and these women are literally holding up their houses. And then we have the, the train tracks that ran through the city and Biggers gives us in these views almost the view as if we are on the train. So we are here and we're looking across the tracks at the women here in front of their shotgun houses and it's almost as if we are sort of moving by. And the positioning of these train tracks here in the immediate foreground of all of these works again sort of adds to that element of that there's a lot going on, that we can see these train tracks as representing different things. In a way, it's very clear that the position of us, the viewer, is across the tracks from these women. So we get that sense, again, of maybe isolation, of segregation, of division, that we are in a different position than them. That idea of being on the right side or the wrong side of the track seems to be quite clear in the images of the shotgun houses. But the way that the train tracks also disappear off both sides of the, the works, to the right and to the left, again, gives us that idea that the train has taken us from one place, it's taking us to another place, this idea not only of transportation, but also simply of this, this migration, this way of getting out. And when we think about the way that we can incorporate these images of the shotgun houses and the women that stand in front of them with the train tracks, and so now going back to the sketch for Ascension, we have right here in the middle, again, the shotgun houses and the women standing on their porches, and then below them, the train tracks, and with them, this family grouping that we see in many of Bigger's works from the 1980s and the 1990s, and you see this in the family art print as well, so here we have our, our family grouping here that we see from the back, just above the, the railroad tracks, so very similar to what we see in Ascension. 
Um, now, we can sort of think about not just all those elements, not just the segregation and division and the idea that the tracks are going off to the sides and we're not entirely sure where they've come from or where they're going, but certainly that emphasizes perhaps some of the more optimistic and hopeful elements. But with Ascension, we also now have this, this reference to history and to, again, this sense of African-American life and we can think about, again, the Great Migration. We can think about the Underground Railroad. There are all these elements from history if we're going to sort of move from origins and the, the origins of life opposite this and then sort of think about the idea of ascension and these people moving up. The train tracks provide such an important element of that at different moments in time. And then again, this kind of dichotomy of um, positive and negative and this transportation that often takes you exactly where you want to go, but maybe doesn't always take you exactly where you thought you were going. And this is uh, just, you can maybe see this better in the actual work, but again, that, that family grouping, this is a motif that becomes really significant in many of Bigger's later works where we see all the family gathered together and then the, the railroad tracks are just underneath them. And here, it kind of then sort of harmonizes with these um, African instruments that we see below them and also um, in terms of the um, kind of parallel um, elements of the, the tracks and of the instruments and then also of the washboard with the pot and other element that we see over and over again in, in Bigger's works. We saw those in the, the shotgun houses on their porches um, and we see them also in I'll leave these two images here of the Biggers murals um, up just because they're lovely. <coughs> but I wanted to, um, to end with a poem. This is Langston Hughes poem from 1949 called One Way Ticket and it's a poem about the Great Migration. And uh, One Way Ticket, incidentally, is the, the name that uh, the Museum of Modern Art used for their exhibition of the Jacob Lawrence panels. And when they displayed all 60 of them together uh, last summer, One Way Ticket was the name of that exhibit that they uh, cribbed here from Langston Hughes. But I think this is a, a great poem that emphasizes this idea of connection. Um, which I think is uh, really what we see in all three of these artists and how we need to think about this theme of transportation and the trains and tracks as used by all three of them, that certainly it doesn't necessarily always represent everything positive, but the overall impression that we are left with is one that is connecting as opposed to separating. I pick up my life and I take it with me. And I put it down in Chicago, Detroit, Buffalo, Scranton, any place that is north and east and not Dixie. I pick up my life and I take it on the train to Los Angeles, Bakersfield, Seattle, Oakland, Salt Lake, any place that is north and west and not south. I am fed up with Jim Crow laws, people who are cruel and afraid, who lynch and run, who are scared of me and me of them. I pick up my life and I take it away on a one-way ticket. Gone up north, gone out west, gone. Thank you. shotgun houses in the 1980s. We see this kind of patterning. A lot of people um, equate this kind of patterning with quilts and the repetition of forms and the idea of the triangle and these kinds of elements. So even in a painting like this that is ostensibly a representational image of these shotgun houses, we see what then very quickly is transformed, say, in the murals to the use of the sacred geometry and the very um, explicit geometric forms and the patterning 
Um, I don't know if you can see it so well here, but this kind of like checkerboard patterning that you have here at the top. And a lot of this, so these are all images really from the 1980s, and with the exception of the gleaners, I don't think there was anything from Biggers that's really much earlier than that that I put in here to show you. But it sort of develops over time, but I think it becomes really prominent in the 1980s. Um, I know that doesn't exactly answer your question, but um, certainly other people may know of examples that are much earlier where we begin to see that. But I think it becomes really prominent in this period. It was probably after 1957 when he had that UNESCO fellowship and he traveled to West Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so after that experience, he struggled with that experience in terms of connecting to his African roots. And part of the reason why he had the geometric patterns is because of the, the um, patterns that were part of the, the uh, textiles. You know, you can see patterns in the, the uh, it can't take off, and he saw that as part of his travels, and I think that influenced him so much that it became part of his art uh, after his travels and with that. So. Yeah, certainly, like what I mentioned with the, the quilts and the shotgun houses, that, that idea of textiles, um, and certainly Biggers is not the only one to be so influenced both by African textiles as well as kind of American textile uh, patterns, but certainly the, the trip to Africa in 1957 is going to be quite... Uh, life-changing for Biggers as it was for many of his contemporaries when they finally got the opportunity to travel to Africa and to be able to, to see these works. And Dr. Biggers told me um, <clears throat> when we had him here doing the prior to the, um, when he started the movies, <coughs> and I made a comment to him that uh, his pieces reminded me of quilts. And he said that when he was uh, a small child, that he had to cut pieces from the books that his grandmother made. So that probably was a, a memory of the South, too. Right. That Certainly always in his head. And he has a wonderful drawing of, uh, it was either his mother or his grandmother quilting. Um, uh, so uh, again, we have to sort of think about that, that image coming out of him as a child cut, cutting these triangles. <laughs> And it, it's probably more evident in origins, I think, than in Ascension, but you can certainly see in the, the drawing uh, many of those geometric elements and how the triangles of the, the kind of overriding lines that echo the, the triangular roofs of the shotgun houses and so forth. And certainly Jim Biggers, his nephew, who uh, worked with him on the murals, um, his own current work, uh, again, continues to employ that idea of the the geometry as well, and, and even in a, a digital component um, today. What is the name of his nephew? James Biggers, James. or Jim, uh, is his nephew who's an artist out of Gastonia. Um, and uh, so he worked uh, with his uncle John Biggers on both the Winston-Salem State murals and also um, right around the same time uh, they executed a pair of murals in the library at Hampton University. Um, in Virginia. Um, so those are two, those two projects date both from the early 1990s. I was doing your presentation, it looked like the uh, Dick of Lawrence images for trains had to do with transportation, the Great Migration more so. And when I looked at the Mir Beery ones that you showed and the uh, Dick of Lawrence ones that you showed, you showed mm -hmm. um, Don Biggers mm -hmm. ones that you showed, uh, almost felt like property values, and that these people own homes, but they can afford one by train tracks, mm -hmm. and we saw one picture with, uh, I guess it was Charlotte in the background, or I guess Stoney in the background. Uh -huh. We see the city, but where they live, by the train right. tracks, affordable. Exactly. And, and, and a lot of that is, you know, again, that whole sort of, you know, idea of the, the train tracks as a separating element, perhaps separating white and black neighborhoods, or even sort of more so uh, social and economic classes of different neighborhoods. So the, the idea being the closer to the train tracks you are, uh, certainly the, the less well off you may be, the farther away. And I think that a lot of that, um, you know, perhaps sort of feeds into this idea that um, if you can afford a better house, it's away from, say, the, the noise and the grit of the train tracks. 
But then when you hear what people like Ramir Bearden and John Biggers talk about and the way that they remember the trains of their childhood, we also have to sort of you know, remember that children often have this, this great affection for trains in all ways, shapes, and sizes. Um, that they, perhaps, if they had chosen where they wanted to live, would have wanted to be as close to the train tracks as possible, regardless of the, the property values. But, um, I mean, that's certainly something that, you know, young children are, are fascinated by trains. But with both Biggers and Bearden, there are numerous quotes that you can find of them as adults talking incredibly nostalgically about their childhoods and where the trains passed close to their house and remembering the train whistles and they remember the names of the conductors on different trains. I think it's Bearden that talks about Jim's train and the idea that the conductor was named Jim and that they knew this and they knew what the train was. It was so important and so fascinating to them, perhaps just because of the idea of trains and what they are, and they're cool looking, and they sound, you know, have all these sights and sounds and everything, but also for what they represent, and that idea of the migration, and the idea that this is a way to, to move on, you know, a kind of sense of progression, which is something that, of course, I think parents always talk to children about, and that there's always that you know, idea that you want your children to move on and move up and do better uh, and so forth. And the trains really are representative of that, that kind of um, sort of upward mobility to a certain extent. Were there other American arts that employed the trans and motif in the works? I don't know of any that employ it quite to this extent. Um, the one um, other artist that I think you do see it a bit is Thomas Hart Benton. So um, American regionalist, uh, there's some great works of Benton at Renolda House, um, and a lot of that has to do with, there are a lot of um, works that Benton creates that have to do with kind of the transformation of America in the early part of the 20th century. So there are certainly images of his that, that incorporate some of these same elements, although to a certain extent, I think with some of Benton's works, they're not they're not necessarily works that are created kind of out of himself, but many of them are commissioned works. Um, like there's one set that I can think of that were, um, I can't remember the exact location, but that were created, commissioned for a particular site, and it's supposed to represent kind of a, a sort of historical cycle in a way. So it's maybe coming a little less out of himself and a little bit more what the commission was. Um, but um, I'm always sort of on the lookout for images of American artists that, that incorporate these trains. And, and I haven't found any that are quite as numerous as what we see in these three. I think they're, they're great examples. There were European artists in the train station. Mm -hmm. um, Certainly with the Impressionists. The Impressionist 19th century European mm -hmm. artists did it too. Yeah, and a lot of that has to do, you know, again, with this idea of transformation and the Impressionists being so interested in representing modern life and things that are new and different and not the sort of academic style of what artists had represented earlier. So in order to show what was kind of cutting edge, the trains and the train stations, and there are some wonderful paintings of Monet of these kind of you know, glass roofed stations with the kind of open airiness. And a lot of that was just kind of a, a break from the past. Um, and so in many ways we can kind of see a lot of those same ideas kind of being picked up in America. Absolutely. I'm just curious, mm -hmm. who in this room knew John Bayer's personal? Knew of it. From that time? Knew it. Knew We're lucky to have a knew core knew group it. in our yeah. heads. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
private and open and willing to talk about his work. Yeah. And he talked about why he included the things that he did and his experiences in Africa. And so you know, I appreciated that. It's, it's open. Very intelligent, very much. And he did his research and he did you Right. Everything that was in his hard work had a meaning. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, and so he would tell you what the history was and why he used this job and why the train uh, tried to fit in. And, uh, there's so many symbols in his work. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, I know the train track is what we're here for. But the question is, it's just astonishing, I think. There's a couple of good videos of him. contribution of women to a uh, democracy and he undertook uh, all this research it was for a uh, YWCA in Houston and the the effect of that and what he had put together was what sort of led ultimately to to, to pulling that together into a dissertation um, and and I think which wasn't necessarily the original purpose but I think it's a good example of how much he immersed himself in two different projects in order to make sure that what he was representing was accurate and it was as extensive as possible and really told the whole story. And he had mostly women in his mm -hmm. art. I mean, you see a handful out of them. There's actually. a lot of women. A lot of, mm -hmm. it's obviously, women were the backbone of the, uh, his uh, upbringing, uh, I'm guessing. I, I don't know. A lot, a lot of his work emphasized the, this concept of strong women, so you do see them over and over again. But yes, I don't know. I, his father died, I believe, when he was a teenager. Does mm -hmm. anyone remember that exactly? Mm -hmm. I seem to recall. I can't remember exactly how old he was, but um, you know, again, I think that that did sort of lead to you know mother and grandmother and these kind of strong women in his life that perhaps <laughs> led him on the, the path. But then there's also you know sometimes. It's a little amb ambiguous who is who, but these family groupings that you see in many of these works, um, and you see them in a lot of these different prints, um, emphasize that idea, not just of women, but of the family, that close connection of the family, of everyone coming together, that was certainly also a really important concept. It's interesting that last Thursday evening, I was in Houston, and the conference I was attending, we went to Texas Southern University, oh, where he taught for many years and to go into the, the museum there and to see a huge mural mm -hmm. that he had done there. It was just fascinating to be there to see that. Yeah, there are a couple. He did lots of murals in Houston and he did a number on the, the campus. That's so I believe the one that in the museum is one that was originally in a different building on the campus that the building got renovated or torn down. They moved it into the museum. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that was the one from the science building. Um, but then I believe that the one in the student center is still in position at Texas Southern, and then maybe there's another one in the business school. So there are a couple of them. So I'm so glad you got to the museum to see it. Yeah. I know, could you go over some more of the elements or symbolism? Uh, you know, say one of them? Well, one of the things that you see often is the turtle. And you're going to see. See the turtle here on the back. So these kids, yeah. and you see it also. Uh, you see it a lot in origins, but you see it. Oh, you see it on the backs here. So the turtle with the connection to water is kind of a symbol of life, um, and a lot of the other animals as well. Like you see rabbits here. Um, again, have to do with that idea of sort of the the continuity of life and the the, the sort of process by which. Um, we go through the, the cycle of life, if you will. Um, yeah, the wash pot, 
is one that you see often, often with the washboard in it. So the, the, the cast iron pot was something that would have been used for a variety of different purposes that would have been used for cooking and for cleaning, and the washboard with it certainly relates to that idea of laundry. So again, and you see a lot of these, you see it over in the um, four seasons. Again, so the women and their shotgun houses, with many of these, again, these same elements, and you see a bunch of the, the turtles on the tracks um, here as well. And the elephant is a, a sacred animal to Africa, so you see that again. Um, some of the other elements that you see here, like the stool is a royal symbol. Again, this, you know, are a lot of these uh, symbols that come from Africa. The, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's kind of like an African xylophone. The gourds and the stylus. Okay, yeah, the gourds. And then there's a, there's a name for this xylophone um, that I can't quite recall, but uh, again, a number of these musical instruments as well. Um, Those are the pigs. The pigs. sorts of really great symbols and a lot of them relate to uh, again the idea of Africa and the origins of life in Africa and coming certainly from that that life-changing um, trip where he, um, he got the UNESCO fellowship to travel in Africa and then a lot of them are very keenly tied to the African-American experience and um, certainly the, the shape of the houses and the tracks and all the other elements and a lot of them are things that he talks about from his childhood the things that he was familiar with that they had around the house and all those kind of elements. And so in many ways, he's sort of capturing things that are lost today, um, things that were very traditional. So Biggers was born in 1924. So those kinds of things that would have been very common in a sort of typical household in, say, the first third of the 20th century, that by the time that he passes, you know, that, that life is really gone. There's a, a tremendous transformation that's going to take place over the course of the 20th century. But these images really capture a lot of those things. Um, I don't think too many people use their cast iron pots and their washboards to do their laundry. <laughs> but just a century ago, you know, that was when all of these three artists were, were born. I mean, that was, that was the way of life. It's amazing how much uh, things have transformed over that time. And I would say that a lot of that course has to do with the railroad <laughs> and other means of transportation. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. A little parting gift for you. This oh. is uh, one of our exhibit posters. Oh, they're beautiful. Yes. Thank you thank very you. much. I really appreciate it.